it has really brought the issue of voter suppression to the forefront and a beginning of a national debate. We're told that hundreds, hundreds of bill changes and amendments are being offered in state legislatures across the country, all modeled after the Georgia goal, or the Georgia outline of reducing the opportunity to vote in America. If you have a functioning democracy where people actually count votes, the number of people who show up is as important as how they vote. And I think that the people in Georgia have realized that with this new approach that they are taking. There's been a broad condemnation of the Georgia voting law, and it's inspired a display of unity in support of our fundamental right to vote across America. It seems that some of my Republican colleagues would rather silence the law's critics than address the very real issues that the law creates. Over the recess, the minority leader, Senator McConnell, issued a warning to the leaders of corporations who were voicing their opposition to the Georgia law. He said to them, you stay out of politics. He apparently did not say, keep your money out of politics, because he has been a fan of the Citizens United decision, which gives those same corporations not only the opportunity, but the experience of spending millions of dollars in every election cycle to affect the outcome. I appreciate the Republican leader's newfound passion for addressing the influence of big corporations, but rather than silencing leaders in the private sector from speaking their minds, which is their constitutional right, I would invite my Republican colleagues to join Democrats in taking more meaningful steps rather, to protect our political system from corporate overreach. They can join us, if they wish, in supporting the For the People Act, a democracy defense bill. The For the People Act would limit the influence of dark money and special interest in our politics, require big money contributors and special interests to actually drop the veil and show us who they are, and tighten the rules that affect super PACs. It's a common sense solution for protecting every American's First Amendment right to free speech, level the playing field of political system so that everybody has an equal say. I'd also invite my Republican colleagues to revive the bipartisan spirit of the Voting Rights Act. I can remember a time when renewal of the Voting Rights Act was a virtually unanimous bipartisan effort. Unfortunately, that changed, and the Supreme Court decision didn't make it any easier. So we are trying with the John Lewis Voting Rights Amendment Advancement Act to return to the days of bipartisanship in addressing the issue of race and politics. That's especially important given the scourge of voter suppression laws we've seen in state legislatures across the country, Georgia being the most recent example. Now this new Georgia law isn't new at all. It emerges from a playbook that is over 120 years old. It goes all the way back to the 1890s when Reconstruction was followed by the Jim Crow era in the South in the creation of something known as the Mississippi Plan. Historian Dr. Carol Anderson, who teaches at Emory University, has referred to the Mississippi Plan, a template of state law, as, quote, a dizzying array of poll taxes, literary, literacy tests, understanding clauses, newfangled voter registration rules, and good character clauses, end of quote. All of these were intentionally racially discriminatory, but dressed up in the genteel garb of the day as bringing integrity back to voting. A politician who sought to replicate the Mississippi plan in the state of Virginia noted that their goal, he was very blunt in what he said, noted their goal was to quote, eliminate every black voter who can be gotten rid of legally without materially impairing the numerical strength of the white electorate. Now, today's voter restrictions might not involve poll taxes, literacy tests, or counting the number of beans in a jar. But like the laws passed during the Jim Crow era, Georgia's new voting law is a deliberate effort to suppress voters, particularly voters of color. There's no other way to describe it when the law includes provisions that make it harder for Georgians to vote. Let me give you some examples. I read an article last week in the New York Times April 11th, Nick Corisanini, I'm sorry, and Reed Epstein, 
did an analysis page by page of what the Georgia law would do, and it was pretty clear why they did it. President Biden won Georgia by just 11,779 votes, 11,779 out of 5 million. The new law that's being proposed and has been signed by the governor of Georgia will curtail ballot access for voters in booming urban and suburban counties, home to many Democratic voters. Another provision makes it a crime, a crime, to offer water to voters waiting in line. And of course, those waiting in line tend to be in densely populated communities and largely minority communities. Some of the things that the Georgia law will do, voters will now have less time to request absentee ballots. Georgia has cut by more than half the period during which voters can request an absentee ballot, from six months to less than three. This will most certainly reduce the number of people seeking absentee ballots and the number of people who actually vote. In the last presidential election, and this is the key sentence that defines the goal of the Georgia leg legislature, in the last presidential election, 1.3 million Georgians, about 26% of the state's electorate, voted with absentee ballots, 26%. Of those who returned absentee ballots last year, in 2020, 65% voted for Joe Biden and 34% chose Donald Trump. You understand why the Republican legislature wants to put an end to the absentee ballot? The shorter window will limit opportunities for get out the vote efforts and put strain on new local election boards, which have less time to process ballot. There are strict new ID requirements for absentee ballots. Previously, the Georgia law required voters to simply sign their absentee ballot applications. Now they have to provide a number from a driver's license or an equivalent state issued identification, virtually certain to limit access. It's now illegal under the new Georgia law for election officials to mail out absentee ballot applications to all voters. When the coronavirus pandemic hit last year, Georgia's Republican Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, mailed absentee ballot applications to every registered voter in the state ahead of the June primary. This led to absentee voting by record numbers of Georgians. When Mr. Raffensperger didn't mail applications again for the general election, several local government agencies did so, particularly in Georgia's large urban counties, a move that was, is now being made illegal by the law created by the legislature and signed by Governor Kemp. With the loss of automatically mailed applications, some voters will invariably not request a ballot since the application served as a reminder to people they were eligible to vote. Keep in mind, it wasn't the ballot that was sent without solicitation. It was an application that had to be returned by the voter before they would actually receive the ballot. It was a reminder, one that the Georgia legislature would like to drop. Speaking of dropping, drop boxes still exist for absentee ballots, but barely. For the 2020 election in Georgia, there were 94 drop boxes across the four counties that make up the core of metropolitan Atlanta. Fulton, Cobb, they pronounce it DeKalb, we call it DeKalb, and Gwinnett. The new law limits the same four counties to a total of 23 drop boxes, from 94 to 23. And it won't just be fewer drop boxes to, put, to deposit your ballot. Instead of 24-hour access outdoors, the boxes are placed indoors at government buildings and early voting sites, and thus will be unavailable for voters to drop off their ballots in the evening and non-business hours, which means more reliance on mail and the uncertainty of that. Mobile voting centers, as they say in the New York Times, think about an RV where you can vote. More than 11,200 people voted at the two vehicles in Fulton County in the last election. These vehicles traversed the county during voting periods, effectively bringing polling sites to people. Georgia has now outlawed this practice. Under the Georgia law, early voting is expanded in a lot of small counties, but not the most populous ones. The new strict rules on early voting hours are likely to curtail voting access for Georgians who actually work for a living, and that's most of them. They'll have less, those with less flexible schedules will have fewer opportunities to vote. 
I spoke to you about the, the single greatest outrage. Ordering food and water to voters waiting in line now risks criminal misdemeanor charges. Long lines for voting in Georgia are an unfortunate reality and often found in the poor, densely populated communities that tend to vote Democratic. During the primary election last June, when temperatures hovered above 80 degrees, high humidity, multiple voting locations across the state had lines in which voters waited more than two hours. Now they will be de denied access to water and food. If you go to the wrong polling place under the new Georgia law, it'll be harder to vote. They put strict requirements there. If election problems arise, a common occurrence, it's more difficult now even in court to extend voting hours. With a mix of changes to vote counting, high turnout elections will probably mean long, long wait for results. We remember what happened last year when during that period of counting and calculating, President Trump went to town with all sorts of bizarre theories rejected by scores of courts as to voter fraud that never was found. Election officials can no longer accept third-party funding, which is a measure that nods to the right-wing conspiracy theories, which President Trump was also peddling. And with an eye toward voter fraud, the state attorney general manages an election hotline. The Republican-controlled legislature has more control over state election board. The secretary of state, for his audacity in challenging Trump's vote fraud theories, has been officially removed as a voting member of the State Election Board by the legislature in Georgia. The GOP-led legislature is empowered to suspend county election officials. The bottom line is this. The Georgians didn't waste any time taking a look at the voting results where they lost two Senate seats for the first time in history and decided that they had to change the rules. That too many voters showed up, the wrong voters. So they decided to change the rules and make it more difficult for those particularly minority voters who wanted to come and express themselves by their right to vote. So the question now is, what are we going to do about it? Well, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Coca-Cola, Delta Airlines, and others have made it clear that this is an outrage. And it's one that we shouldn't countenance or accept in the 21st century. This, unfortunately, was an exercise in the 19th century to re-enslave African Americans after the Civil War. Sadly, vestiges of that continued right on up until the 1960s when the new Civil Rights Act ended up banning some of the most outrageous conduct that came out of the Jim Crow era. Now the Republican Party nationally, the Georgia Republican Party, the governor, and the legislature have decided to return to those days. What a sad commentary it is on Mr. Lincoln's Republican Party. It was embarrassing enough as a Democrat to realize that the earliest stages of Jim Crow were created, conceived, and enforced by Democrats of their day. For Republicans, they fought that effort, as they should, in the name of Lincoln and what he brought to their party nationally. And now today, the tables have turned 180 degrees. It is the Democrats who are trying to bring to the public's attention what is happening in Georgia and in other states. It is sad that the Republicans have decided that the only way to win an election is to control the vote, that their ideas can't sell, can't be sold anymore to voters across this country. Madam President, I ask consent that the following statement I'm about to make be placed at a separate part in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, no state, no community in America has been spared from the coronavirus pandemic. Nationwide, we've lost nearly 570,000 mothers, fathers, grandparents, neighbors, friends. In Illinois, the number is 21,000. Like so many other diseases and health conditions, the pandemic has inflicted disproportionate harm on communities of color, black Americans, Native Americans, and members of the Latinx community. Sadly, these disparities come as no surprise. America has a long history of medical inequality. From premature births to premature death, People of color suffer disproportionately in America's troubled health system. People of color in America suffer more chronic and acute health conditions. They're likely to go without needed medical care, shorter life expectancies. The reason for the disparities are many, but they include access to affordable health care, inadequate research, and too few health care professionals. Martin Luther King, Jr. called health care inequality, quote, the most shocking and inhumane form of injustice. 
Far too often this inequality begins be even before birth. It should shock the conscience of America, one of the na wealthiest nations on earth, that we have one of the poorest records on the globe for the maternal health. Think of this. The United States is one of only 13 nations in the world where the maternal mortality rate, the death of mothers, is worse now than it was 25 years ago. How is that possible? Every year in America, nearly 1,000 women die from pregnancy-related complications. 70,000 others suffer near-fatal complications as a result of pregnancy. And now, think of this. Women of color in the United States are three times more likely than white women to die as a result of pregnancy. In Illinois, sadly, that number is six times more likely. What makes these maternal deaths even more tragic is that an estimated 60%, more than half of them, are preventable. I've given much thought to this and spoken with real experts, which is why Robin Kelly, the congresswoman from Illinois, and I joined with Senator Duckworth and a number of other Democratic senators introducing legislation to decrease America's rates of maternal sickness and death, especially among new mothers of color. We called our measure the Mama Act. One of the major provisions of this legislation is a requirement that Medicaid provide health coverage for new moms for a full post-pregnancy period instead of just 60 days, which it currently is. Congressman Kelly and I worked hard to get a modified version of this provision in the American Rescue Plan, President Biden's singular achievement in the first few weeks in office. And thanks to that law, states now have the option to expand their Medicaid program for new mothers for the next five years. Making sure new moms have health coverage for a full year post-pregnancy, a full year post-pregnancy, will go a long way toward catching, preventing, and treating potentially life-threatening conditions and problems. This is critical because in some states, even my state of Illinois, nearly 60% of pregnancy-associated deaths occur between 43 and 364 days postpartum. Well, there's good news to report today. While we're still working to pass the MAMA Act, the state of Illinois pursued another avenue for expanding Medicaid coverage for new moms. For over a year, Illinois has been seeking a Medicaid Section 1115 waiver to allow Medicaid-eligible women in our state to keep their health coverage for a year after their pregnancy. Representatives Kelly, Underwood, Senator Duckworth, and I have been leading letters and championing this effort for our state. And this week, I am happy to announce the Biden-Harris administration granted that waiver, making Illinois the very first state in the nation to extend postpartum Medicaid coverage for new moms. This will ensure access to vital health services and help to promote better birth outcomes and reduce the rate of maternal sickness and death in my home state. And I hope set the stage and model for other states to follow. I can think of no better way to honor this year's Black Maternal Health Week than to support state efforts to expand Medicaid health care to, to new moms. Another way would be to pass Senator Booker's 2021 Black Maternal Health Week resolution, which I'm proud to co-sponsor. As the poet Maya Angelou told us, we can't change the past, but when we know better, we must do better. We now know that we can do better to protect the lives of pregnant women and newborn babies, and I'm pleased that my state of Illinois will be part of leading in that effort. Madam President, I ask that the following statement be placed in a separate part of the record. No objection. Thank you, Madam President. Today, in Chicago, at Lurie Children's Hospital, one of our best, little one-year-old Caden Swan is in critical condition, clinging to life in the pediatric intensive care unit. Last week, at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday morning on Lakeshore Drive, one of the busiest thoroughfares in the city, one-year-old Caden was shot in the head while riding in the back seat of a car. He was an innocent victim hit in a road rage shooting. As we pray for Caden's recovery, as we express gratitude for the medical workers who are working around the clock to keep him alive, we have to ask ourselves a basic question. When it comes to this sickening gun violence that happens every day in our country, what are we going to do? Give up or stand up? 
On March 23rd, I held a hearing in, the in our Judiciary Committee on gun violence. There was a mass shooting spree that killed eight people in Atlanta, Georgia on the day when I announced the hearing. Then there was a mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado that killed 10 people the night before the hearing. Others have followed. Since that hearing on March 23rd, according to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been at least 38 mass shootings in less than a month in America. Mass shooting is defined as an incident where at least four people were shot. This past weekend, and I'm sorry to say this is not an exception, 25 people were shot in the city of Chicago alone. Every day we lose 109 American lives to gun violence. Hundreds more are shot and wounded, carrying emotional scars for a lifetime. These victims are our neighbors, our friends, our family, and even a one-year-old baby like Caden Swan. I'm glad President Biden is stepping up to this issue and taking action. Last week, the President stood in the White House Rose Garden and called gun violence exactly what it is. It is a public health crisis. He's right. We need to take a public health approach to reduce violence that's killing so many of our fellow Americans. There is a playbook that works. We need to gather study and study the problem, data and study the problem, identify causes and risk factors, develop targeted prevention and intervention strategies that help bring the number of shootings down. We've stopped epidemics before. We're in the midst of doing one now. If we're willing to stand up and act, it works. President Biden took action last week and announced a set of common sense steps consistent with the Second Amendment and that actually will help reduce violence. He wants to reduce the prol proliferation of homemade ghost guns, which are untraceable and often undetectable. Regulate the use of stabilizing braces that can convert effectively pistols into sharp barreled rifles, like the weapon that was used by the gunman in Boulder. Put forth a model state extreme risk protection order law to help guide states that want to use these life-saving interventions. Restart the annual firearms trafficking report that tricks patterns of illicit gun trafficking. And nominate an ATF veteran and gun safety expert, David Chipman, to give the ATF its first confirmed leader since 2015. I'm going to pay special attention to this nominee because it comes through the Senate Judiciary Committee. How many times have you heard it said, we don't need new laws, we just need to enforce the laws that are on the books? Well, one of the agencies that enforces these laws is Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Division, ATF. What the gun lobby has done over the years to make sure the gun ATF didn't have any money or didn't have any leaders. We haven't had anyone in the post for six years with Senate confirmation at ATF. I want to change that if we can. At last, but certainly not least, the President announced billions of dollars for evidence-based community violence intervention programs through the American Jobs Program and other grant efforts. These are smart and targeted important proposals well within the bounds of the Constitution and the President's authority. I commend him for that action. But we shouldn't leave it to the President alone. We have a responsibility, too. We've got to make sure we close the loopholes in the gun background check system that make it too easy for criminals and those with mental instability to get guns. We've known it for years, but we haven't closed these gaps. The House has passed a universal background check legislation. Now the ball's in the Senate court. We need at least 10 Republicans if all Democrats will support it. I hope my Republican colleagues are willing to stand up and vote to close these gaps. There are other common sense changes we can make that deal with gun violence and community prevention. At a hearing I held on March 23rd, Dr. Selwyn Rogers of the University of Chicago Medicine pointed out that NIH has nearly $43 billion for medical research, only $12.5 million dollars dedicated funding for research into reducing gun violence. We need to invest more into this research and CDC research, too. We also need to support evidence-based community programs that show that they are effective in reducing violence. Saving lives from the horrors of gun violence should not be a partisan issue. It's absolutely heartbreaking to think about little Caden Swan sitting in the back seat of a car on Lakeshore Drive, which I look out from my place in Chicago and see every day and realized that he was shot in the head at the age of one and now is fighting to survive. The 
The question is, what are we going to do with this challenge? With 40,000 gun violence deaths every year and more than 100 every day, give up or stand up? Well, I'll tell you, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to do all I can to push common sense constitutional reforms to bring gun violence to an end in America. Madam President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin.